Minister Ekonomi WMG dan Guest Lecture 2023. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Pertama-tama, marilah kita panjatkan puji dan syukur kehadiran Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala yang telah memberikan kita rahmat dan hidayah sehingga kita dapat berkumpul dalam acara ini. Tak lupa salawat serta salam semoga tercurah kepada junjungan kita Nabi Besar Muhammad SAW. Semoga senantiasa kita mendapatkan syafaat hingga akhir zaman dan amin ya Rabbal Alamin. Hadirin yang berbahagia, selamat datang pada acara Soft Launching Magister Ekonomi UMG dan Guest Lecture 2023. Perkenalkan saya Ibnu Hajar selaku pembawa acara akan membacakan susunan acara kita pada hari ini. Uh, acara terdiri dari dua sesi. Yang pertama soft launching program RT dan sesi kedua guest lecture. Marilah kita buka acara dengan membaca basmalah secara bersama-sama. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Selanjutnya Presentasi tentang Magister Ekonomi WNI yang akan disampaikan oleh Prof. Endah Sabtu Tindingsi kepada Ibu Endah kami persilakan. Disyukur kita panjatkan kehadiran Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala sehingga pada hari ini kita bisa bertemu dalam acara soft launching Magister Ekonomi UMG dan Guest Lecture ya, yang tentu saja tamunya dari jauh ya, uh, Ibu Kodia. Ibu Kodia. <laughs> Oke, okay. um, thank you Kodia. Sudah uh, Bersedia mengisi acara pada hari ini, tentunya teman-teman juga sabar juga nanti belajar tentang environmental assessment video ini akarnya, ya. Dan kebetulan topik uh, di pekan ini adalah tentang environmental assessment. Ya. Oke, okay, sebelum kita mulai geser, cinta, mohon uh, sekitar dua pekan yang lalu kita sudah mendapatkan SK pendirian magister ekonomi. Jadi teman-teman yang besok ingin studi lanjut, yang namanya kuliah itu kan investasi. Ya, kita kuliah sekarang, insya Allah anda tidak berhenti belajar, insya Allah nanti ke depan oh, akan banyak manfaatnya. Nah, kita sudah dapatkan izin SK untuk uh, menjalankan program magister ekonomi. Jadi fakultas ekonomi dan bisnis sekarang punya tiga magister. Ada magister akuntansi, magister manajemen yang sudah lama, dan juga yang sekarang magister ekonomi. Harapannya nah, nanti teman-teman bisa lanjut studi ke magister ekonomi. Dan uh, saya akan menjelaskan sedikit terkait dengan magister ekonomi ini. Yang pertama, profilnya apa sih? Sebelum kita bicara tentang profil, uh, misi misinya apa? Misi magister ekonomi itu menjadi program studi magister yang unggul dan terkemuka di ASEAN. Ya, jadi pengennya kita nanti menjadi tenaga profesional ya dan juga uh, bisa bersaing secara global maupun dalam uh, persaingan industri. Nah, di sini nanti akan didukung dengan pengembangan informasi dan teknologi. Ini uh, profil magister ekonomi. Jadi akademisi dan jadi praktisi. Ya. Jadi kalau besok Anda uh, lulus dari magister ekonomi, itu bisa nanti melanjutkan jadi dosen, atau jadi tenaga pengajar, gitu. atau mungkin bisa kerja di praktisi. Dan kita pun tidak menutup kemungkinan membuka peluang bagi teman-teman yang sudah bekerja, alumni-alumni kami yang sudah bekerja juga sudah uh, kami hubungi juga siapa yang berminat, cukup banyak juga yang banyak tanya magister ekonomi, uh, lalu juga yang untuk lembaga-lembaga misalnya pemerintah, pemda dan sebagainya, ataupun dia yang sudah bekerja di bank dan sebagainya, itu juga bisa uh, masuk ke magister ekonomi. Keunggulannya apa? Intinya di sini kita sudah akreditasi karena kita buka 
pertama kali maka harmonisasinya dengan baik. Jadi saya baik. Begitu nanti semester depan kalau, kalau mungkin uh, tahun depan kita sudah diminta untuk me mengajukan aktivitasi kembali. Jadi dari baik nanti insya Allah jadi lebih. So, jadi harapannya anda lulus nanti kalau anda kuliah di situ sudah unggul. Nah, lalu kita juga memiliki jaringan amal usaha. Ya, e, jadi kita tidak lepas bahwa ini adalah e, di bawah lembaga media otomatis kita punya e, amal usaha media dan juga jaringan kerjasama pendidikan kita punya asosiasi fakultas ekonomi, asosiasi program uh, studi ekonomi dan sebagainya. Lalu di sini kita mengembangkan pendidikan, ya, pendidikan penelitian ekonomi Islam. Lalu juga uh, dan yang kita unggulkan adalah nanti anda lulus dari magister itu nanti anda punya sertifikasi. Karena kita di UMI itu punya LSP yang uh, di bawah BMSP. Kalau kita itu kalau punya sertifikasi, kalau nggak ada nama menunggu garuda emasnya, nggak nggak mampu. Dan LSP kita itu ada nama garuda emas. Jadi insya Allah kalau misalnya anda sudah punya sertifikasi BNSP itu uh, dipertimbangkan ketika masuk ke dunia kerja. Karena bisa nanti mengambil sertifikasi juga di program magister ekonomi ini. Meskipun nanti ketika anda ini semester enam ya, semoga semester Nah, kalau mau semester 7 ambil di atas klinik juga jadi anda nanti bisa punya dua sertifikasi itu lebih lebih top dibandingkan yang tidak punya ataupun yang hanya satu dan ada banyak skema anda nanti bisa uh, buka di webnya LSP lalu juga um, tenaga pengajar yang mereka sendiri dosen-dosen kita yang guru besar sudah tiga ambil Ya. Dan juga hampir semuanya adalah gitu. Lalu um, unikan keunikan. Saya pasti kena angin ya. Mana dia nak kena angin? Jadi batuk. Jadi kita diintegrasikan dengan um, nilai-nilai Islam di setiap mata kuliah dan juga um, nanti akan untuk mengkaji tentang um, apa? ekosistem industri halal itu yang nanti konsentrasi ekonomi Islam. Lalu juga ada yang uh, konsentrasinya nanti kita punya dua konsentrasi saya akan jelaskan nanti. Lalu juga mendukung sektor pariwisata ya, karena ada nanti juga warna uh, kuliah yang kaitannya dengan uh, ekonomi pariwisata. Lalu juga ekonomi hijau dan juga um, yang ekonomi Islam nanti ada terkait dengan dana wakaf itu akan dikaji lebih mendalam dan juga digitalisasi ekonomi uh, terkait dengan perbankan dan keuangan syariah dan yang terakhir nanti kita juga belajar tentang perencanaan pembangunan ekonomi nah itu cocok sekali kalau misalnya nanti ada kelas yang bagi bagi partisipasi yang dari pemda uh, atau bangda nah komunitasnya itu ada dua yang pertama adalah ekonomi Islam ekonomi Islam ini ada semester 1, semester 2, dan semester 3, semester 3 nanti ada sudah kerja. Ya. Jadi ada cuma setahun kuliah, berikutnya sudah masih. Oh, terus nggak kayak sekarang. Karena masih sebentar lagi baru masih. Nah, di semester 1 nanti kita belajar teori ekonomi, lalu teknik analisis kebijakan pembangunan, lalu usul fikih dan metodologi penelitian. Makanya siswa itu satu anda belajar metodologi penelitian itu sudah dicil di tim basis. Jadi universitas kita itu mulai semester satu mulai dicil di tim basis. Tapi semester dua lagi kan semester tiga nggak perlu sampai semester semester ada sudah selesai. Sambil ngambil sertifikasi. Lalu di semester 2, nanti ada manajemen resiko perbankan syariah, ada digitalisasi sistem perbankan dan keuangan syariah, lalu ada ekonomi dana wakaf, ekonomi dan inovasi industri halal, dan isu kontemporer. Dan ini akan dibahas di semester 2 untuk yang peminatan ekonomi islam. Dan semester 3 nya ada yang sudah selesai. Lalu yang development, sustainable development economics. 
kurangnya gue kemudian paling juta. Nah, untuk yang semester satu sama, ya. baik ekonomi Islam maupun ekonomi pembangunan kamu juga, mata kuliahnya sama, begitu semester dua anda sudah mulai berkomunikasi dengan masing-masing. Di sini ada perencanaan pembangunan regional, lalu ada ekonomi spasial dan SIG, ini yang kemarin sudah ada di SIG, besok di uh, register lebih teknologi, lebih menancar, lalu ada ekonomi hijau, ada juga ada ekonomi hijau, di sana nanti lebih ke penerapan bagaimana, lalu ada pengawasan dan manajemen um, sumber daya, dan ada juga manajemen pariwisata dan jaga budaya. Nah ini di semester dua untuk uh, pembinaan um, sustainable di bawah ini semester tiga nya anda sudah tesis. Nah ini bukan SKS ya, jadi ada tiga puluh enam, ada berapa? Seratus empat puluh satu empat puluh enam. Selisih seratus sepuluh, sepuluh enam anda sudah punya gelar MA, SA, MA. Lalu ada di sini kelas master tujuh puluh. Anda nanti kalau yang lulus dari prodi ekonomi tidak perlu masuk masi. Tapi kalau yang dari luar bukan prodi ekonomi. Terus masih kelas itu, karena belum belajar dasar-dasarnya. Kalau anda nggak tahu, langsung anda kuliah itu beda. Bedanya nanti di biaya juga. Kalau ada masih kelas itu, nanti biayanya lebih mahal dibandingkan yang tanpa masih kelas. Lalu um, tugas akhirnya berupa tesis dan tadi anda ikut sertifikasi. Nah, untuk yang akan mengambil tesis itu kalau register bedanya adalah tesis plus publikasi simpan simpan dua ya. tapi kalau anda misalnya nggak punya tesis cukup dua simpan simpan dan simpan ya simpan dua aku simpan dua itu mestinya anda sekarang mulai sudah kadang dosen kan juga minta dibikin um, apa minta bikin paper kan dan itu nanti anda sudah mulai belajar bagaimana membuat jurnal ah, artikel di jurnal jadi nanti anda cukup dua dua cerita sudah nggak usah pakai tesis tapi kalau cuma satu aja anda nggak perlu pakai tesis ya lalu um, tadi ada beberapa semester kuliah semester jadi ada beberapa tiga semester semester satu kali dua belas SKS semester dua lima belas dan tesisnya sembilan SKS Nah, kalau tadi ada dua simpan, itu setara dengan sembilan SKS. Biaya totalnya sampai dengan lulus. Memperkuat regulasi, ya, sekitar dua puluh enam. Bisa kurang, bisa sedikit. Tapi harapannya dua puluh enam itu maksimum. Ya. Karena kalau bandingkan sama yang di Jakarta, itu sekitar lima puluh enam. Itu baru bisa dapat dua puluh enam. Terus, um, Nah, sertifikasinya ini sebenarnya hanya sebagian, masih banyak lagi yang Anda bisa buka di uh, webnya LSP, tapi yang lebih nyambung dengan Anda itu Anda bisa baru di Google. Ada operasi yang berperan pekerja sampai lengkap, ada terus perbincangan publik, rekoprai, ada juga fasilitas pembayaran masyarakat, dan juga tenaga uh, informasi banyak gitu. Lalu, um, Nah ini intik perkuliahannya ada dua kali. Jadi insya Allah setiap semester diperlukan. Anda harus mengambil umur satu tahun, tapi setiap semester September dan Maret insya Allah di Malaysia. Ya. Anda nunggu Anda lulus dulu. Skripsi kan besok sudah selesai. Nah, bisa daftar di 2024. Ya. Lulusnya Februari langsung kuliah. Masalah kuliahnya nggak perlu lama, anda nggak dapat kuliah lagi. Cuma satu setengah tahun sudah dapat SA, MA, aduh dulu. Nggak apa-apa, kan anda nanti semakin anda apa punya gelar, punya kompetensi lebih tinggi, apa namanya, lebih kemungkinan atau kegabilitas untuk menerima di orang yang kerja itu kan lebih bagus dibandingkan yang hanya SA saja. 
Nah ini dosen obesnya yang nyari mana tapi sebenarnya yang ngajar tapi yang kayak cuma ini cuma ini kompisnya tapi apa dosen yang kompis kompis itu apa ya rumahnya rumahnya di Mekis tapi beliau juga ngajar di Esapu juga yang ngajar di Esapu juga ngajar di Esapu selain beliau juga lalu um, peluang kerja di bagian belum bekerja tapi nanti kalau misalnya mereka sudah kerja kalau mau di register juga bisa tapi buat anda yang besok kalau misalnya lulus itu bisa ada berbagai macam peluang kerja yang ada di sini nah, selain ini sebetulnya juga oh, masih banyak kemungkinan juga diterima di berbagai bidang lalu ini juga untuk yang Islamic economics ya ada beberapa peluang kerja kita bisa kerja oke okay. Oke, di sini ada pertanyaan. Sebelum lanjut ke case like, ya. Ya, makan. Ya, nah. Kalau enggak ada penjelasan. Oh, sekarang ada Magista. Terus, cerita cerita sama bapak ibu. Sama mama, papa. Sama bunda. Iya. Bunda, ayah. Boleh enggak lanjut studi ini? Lulus saja belum, ya kan bertahan lagi, tinggal beberapa bulan, banyak nyampe, ya, bulan, nyampe nggak dua belas bulan, nggak nyampe kan ya, sekarang sudah bulan, um, Mei, ya satu tahun lagi lah, paling nggak kan, ngajak-ngajak, ayah ngaku dulu, biar, biar aku bisa kuliah lagi, gitu. Ya, ada pertanyaan enggak? Ya, silakan. Nah, biasanya kalau itu kelas-kelas yang um, bekerja. Kayaknya seperti itu. Tapi sebenarnya enggak boleh. Kayaknya seperti itu. Mungkin uh, mereka sudah kerja. Sementara harus bekerja dari Senin sampai Jumat dan mereka berada di luar pulau Jawa, prakteknya by online. Cuma tetap ada kelas yang offline, cuma dalam range waktu. Yang online tuh. Oke, yang lain. Ya, tadi. Dan ya, oke kalau nanti misalnya ada pertanyaan, kita bisa ke Prodi atau bisa paskan, paskan nanti cari register ekonomi. Kalau mau deket ya ke kantor Prodi aja nih, banyak sama Bu Emma. Atau ke Prodi atau ke BI Corner. Di sana ada masyarakat juga, ada Prodi juga. Oke. Mungkin ke depan nanti ada program master ya. Jadi kuliah mau selesai dia bisa langsung. Cuma ini kan baru proses ya. Universitas baru proses untuk melaksanakan program master tersebut. Nah itu akan dilakukan di semester depan atau semester depannya itu terjadi dari universitas. Jadi rencananya memang ada master. Jadi mahasiswa yang sudah terkenal. Semoga tujuannya langsung bisa mengesuk. Hmm. Cuma ini baru digodok oleh universitas, saya belum bisa mengumumkan. Gitu. Kalau universitas sudah oke, okay, maka saya akan kabar di Anda. Lagi. Dan ini sekarang kita baru uh, mencoba menginisiasi, uh, semoga bisa jadi double degree. Jadi Anda nanti kuliah setahun di Um, MA setahun di luar negeri nanti dapat misalnya MA MBA gitu MA gitu. Nah ini baru diinisiasi dengan pihak ya, luar.
Oke, ada saya enggak? Oke, kalau ada saya kembalikan ke Mabilaito Sikuridaya Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh Baik, terima kasih kita ucapkan kepada Ibu Eda. Alhamdulillah acara sesi pertama kita sudah selesai. Untuk selanjutnya kita memasuki acara kedua. Then entering the second session, the guest lecture on the topic of environmental assessment bill will be led by moderator Dr. Dian Setiawati Dewanti. Dian Dewanti is the Vice Dean of Faculty of Economic and Business Universitas Muhammadiyah Yogyakarta to Dr. Dian. The time is your. Thank you, Master Ceremony. Well, uh, gladly that today we will have a guest lecture by Dr. Claudia um, Arapena. <laughs> I think this is the second time you're coming to UMY to have the guest lecture. Previously, it's also concerning environmental, but it was online or? It was online, yeah. Oh, yeah, and then online for that. But today, we, we are really lucky that we have offline. We can meet uh, Dr. Claudia. As you can see in the poster, you see that she's really beautiful and bit more beautiful as the real rather than the poster. <laughs> so I really adore to her. I know that. I love the, the face of um, Dr. Claudia, very beautiful. So before we start, I would like to introduce Dr. Claudia Arafina. She is the doctor, uh, she is the assistant professor in economics. Her research is highly interdisciplinary in a large variety of areas within energy, environmental and behavioral economics. She is conducting research in energy efficiency, energy transition, electric vehicles, hydrogen, valuation and payments for ecosystem services, land use, consumer behavior, technology adoption, conservation and quality and inequities, uh, carbon prices and green bonds, among other topics. So this research is greatly developed at national and international level with partner universities and stakeholders in the UK, Europe, Latin America, Asia and Africa. She is currently the president elect of the Latin America Environmental and Resource Economic Association. And she is also a member of the Environment of Development Initiative through the Columbia EFD Research Center at the Research Group on Environmental, Natural Resource and Applied Economic Studies in Universidad de los Andes, Colombia. Dr. Arafena, she is a she is active member of two international steering committee groups, the Sustainable Energy Transition Initiative, SBTI, and the Emission Pricing for Development, APFT. So without any overdue, because if I have to read all of the uh, CV of Dr. Claudia, it will be a guest lecture one session for you. So without any overdue, I will please do Dr. Claudia to give uh, her um session so time is yours dr claudia thank you very much for the invitation and for uh it's really an honor and i'm really happy to be here again sharing with uh, you and all the students uh this uh, lecture uh, i'm gonna imitate you so i'm gonna go to the <laughs> so uh, and well, hello uh, everybody. Uh, thank you for the introduction. And um, as I said, like uh, uh, I'm really happy to be here to share with you um, a bit of what I did. I'm going to be talking uh, today uh, about uh, environmental assessment, uh, the role that uh, environmental communication in project assessment. So. Uh, Feel free uh, to interrupt me at any stage of my presentation if you have any questions or any comments, okay? 
So feel free to raise your hands and, uh, and ask the question. So don't wait until the end, okay? Because we even forget uh, what we are gonna ask or talk, okay? Um, Claudia, uh, for the students, if they, you want to ask something, you can ask using Bahasa Indonesia and I will translate it to you. Oh, yeah, okay. it's so they, yes, they're not, yes, yes. they're not ashamed to raise some question. Bisa menggunakan Bahasa Indonesia dan saya bisa membantu to translate. So you can use Bahasa Indonesia and I will translate it. Let us make it twice, yeah. And point tambah buat nilai degradasi. Yes. Saya sudah siapkan tulisan, jadi saya sudah siap menulis nomor NIM. Silakan sebutkan nama dan nomor NIM. Lengkap 2020 043 00 something. Yeah. Okay, sorry to interrupt you. No. <laughs> Please. And actually that's very good because uh, it always helps uh, when I uh, teach uh, in Diego, it always helps. When they ask the question, yes, in Indonesia, Indonesia. And, uh, and then you, you I will translate. It's helping to get Indonesian questions, <laughs> but I need yes. help. <laughs> no, 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 what I'm going to be uh, telling you uh, today is that I'm going to talk uh, about environmental sensory in a very general way first. And then we are going to touch on environmental sensory sustainability. Uh, then we'll introduce uh, the uh, environmental evaluation techniques. Um, I'm going to be uh, Make uh, doing this teaching with an example. So, a uh, case study you probably will have in a, in a, during your courses in the masters in some lectures about environmental evaluation and other type of things. What I'm going to bring you here is an example of how you use that in real world. How what you are going to be learning. In a uh, year, you are going to be uh, used later on. Okay, so uh, it's very uh, simple. I, I put it in a very simple way. Okay, uh, I, I am not presenting today the econometrics or all that part. Uh, what I want you to get from here is that when you walk out uh, from here, you know how you're going to use. The uh, learning you are getting here in your work, uh, in your decision making, if you are working in a government or in other institutions, okay? So, environmental assessment. What is uh, the environmental uh, assessment? It's basically a uh, process uh, that it describes and reports impacts. So it's the process in which we identify uh, the impacts of an activity of a project, and those uh, impacts are in humans. It could be in water, humans, animals, uh, air, uh, plants, landscape, everything that is related to nature. And actually, I would say myself that we need to start to do the environmental assessment, but I would call it socio environmental assessment because the social part of it, as you see there, I'm talking about a human. Humans is a very important part of what is the impact on the environment and uh, and all the what we do every day. So through the environmental assessment, what we are doing is describing what are the impacts of an activity, what are the impacts of tourists, for example, on the environment, on the social, economic, uh, uh, environment of, uh, of a community. And so what is the impact of a project, an energy project? 
own uh, environment, own the activities of people, okay? So, so what uh, the environmental assessment does is identify in a very stage the those impacts. So before we are going and uh, build uh, a building, before we go and uh, do an activity, we we do this assessment and to identify what are the the impact, what are the problems that we can have, and then make decisions on how we are going to mitigate it or if we go ahead or not with a project. So it takes the impacts into consideration during the decision making process, and that's the important part of it: the decision making process. So we have two types of environmental impact assessments. Uh, of impact assessment. So if one is the biomedical impact assessment, as it says, and the other that uh, is the strategic environmental assessment. In uh, uh, which uh, the, the, those are things that are very um, important for a country. So building a hospital, a uh, main road that we for those uh, the the decision are mainly on the on the government and the consultation sometimes uh, is is not done. And the others, many times, uh, governments do consultation with people. Why is this? This is to identify all the types of different impacts uh, that can uh, have a project, and then they make uh, the decisions for the environment for the society. So, what are the goals of uh, environmental, of doing environmental assessment? The goals are the first thing is inform the decision making. And in two ways, inform the decision making in the public arena, but also in the private one. It's not only uh, the government or uh, uh, the uh, governmental institutions. Uh, stakeholders that do environmental assessments uh, is also uh, private companies. They do their own environmental assessments. Uh, sometimes they are fully uh, private, confidential. Sometimes they make that available. So uh, why, what is the other uh, goal uh, we have here is protect the natural environment and human health from the negative uh, impacts or effects. So we do this because we want to protect the environment. We want to identify what can happen and be ready to either mitigate uh, or protect uh, the environment. So it, it, that is what you see in, in the last one. Also to design the mitigation measures or the policies uh, that we are going to design for uh, uh, dealing with the project. Um, we also have as a goal to involve a uh, public into the decision making process to increase social acceptance of voice. And uh, uh, this is important uh, because uh, environmental policies, some environmental policies sometimes are not very welcome by society. And the typical example of this are carbon taxes. Uh, if you see the news uh, years ago uh, in France, when the carbon tax was implemented, there was all these riots, the uh, yellow vests that were against. Uh, so, so when you make policy, what you want to do is design policy that will be effective. If the people are not uh, accepting a policy, then you will have a much higher cost than uh, the just cost of uh, the policy. And then you will have delays as well. So when we do uh, environmental assessment, one of the goals as well is to involve the public in the decision-making process and to see if we have First, if we have social acceptance, and second, if we have or we don't have enough to increase that social acceptance. 
So when we do a project, it is uh, welcome and it is effective. Okay. So uh, an example of this uh, in um, Scotland. There is a big de uh, commercial development that is done in the city center. In a place where there is a lot of history, there are, uh, there are places that are uh, uh, house, house call, um, uh, um, uh, that are protected uh, by the culture and heritage. And they, they started to make a big commercial development. So what uh, was done before that was environmental assessment. And uh, they, they started to see not only the impact that project was going to have into the air pollution, into the, uh, in the city, into the water uh, uh, quality, uh, in also the traffic, OK? But uh, also into the people, on the people, that live there. And they call people to, to, uh, to question the people like, okay, what, uh, what do you think about the project? So there was all this consultation. People were a lot against. They didn't want the project. But thanks to the consultation, they took all these points that, okay, you cannot use this type of material. You cannot use this type of iron because it's not so, uh, is more polluting, you need to uh, use sustainable materials. So uh, they had to uh, put there more trees. So they changed the project in a way that uh, was more environmental friendly and people started to like the project more. So the social acceptance of that project increased because of the consultation they did, and because they were working together with their people and doing the assessment. So that's also one of the goals uh, why we do this uh, type of assessment. And the last uh, point on uh, uh, or goal of environmental uh, assessment is this the internalization of externalities of those projects and uh, activities. Uh, there is a type of this, of projects or activities. <laughs> so, um, and this is what I'm gonna focus then on externalities. Do you know what is an externality? Let, raise your hand those who, uh, know or have heard about externalities. Okay, we have one, only one person. Well, no worries. We are going to cover that in here. So, so, and this is for that. One of the things while we do uh, environmental assessment is uh, for um, uh, to actually Try to internalize, identify, and internalize externalities. So, before I go to externalities, and because that's what I'm gonna focus later in, in the lecture. So, what we want with environmental assessment is to inform decision making again in the public or private arena. So, we want to give information, we want to make a, a project happen or not happen, sometimes uh, we need to decide, okay, should we go ahead or not? Or if we go ahead, what is the best way uh, to go ahead, okay? So, and um, some examples of the types of decision uh, making or the types of policies uh, we can, uh, we can implement or we can think about when we talk about environmental sensor is permits. So if we need to uh, give permits uh, for developing a certain type of activity and uh, planning, when, when you are planning uh, uh, a city or the extension of a city, you need to make the environmental assessment. 
to see what are the consequences of the impact that we have on environment, on the people living there. And then for designing a policy instruments, for example, compensation schemes. Think about a um, wind farm that will generate electricity. Okay, and there is a company coming and doing this wind farm. So you need to think, okay, this is the environmental assessment. Well, uh, wind farm, everyone think like, oh, it's something a good excellent, yes. It has an impact. And uh, that complains a lot about so well, you know, it's in my yeah. I don't like to see that and, and and there are a lot of strategies to mitigate those things from the color. And this is funny uh, when you see the wind farms, they are not white because you know they all are white, they are white because they have actually a um, study that, that is the color that makes the least uh, impact into the. Uh, the landscape. So um, so yeah, and uh, when we think then to um refer, many times uh, companies have to compensate people that live close. And um, so so how do you design that compensation? How much how much money do you actually have to give if you are a company to the people that will uh, be affected by a wind. On one side, they will be benefited because they may get a cheaper electricity. But on the other side, they probably don't like to see the, the windmills producing. Okay? And generally, the companies have uh, to give a compensation. And so, how I calculate that? Especially when you think like, what is the value? And this is what I'm gonna uh, talk uh, later on. What is the value of the landscape? How, how do you actually uh, give a value to that? If you want, it's very difficult. What if you, I ask you, what is the value of the clean air? Or the clean water? Is, there is no a market for that. So that's what I'm gonna uh, be talking uh, in a bit. So before that, uh, let's just uh, uh, in a very uh, quick uh, way, talk about sustainability. Because what we want uh, by doing this environmental assessment is to get into the path of sustainability uh, as in, in the United Nations as, um, is introduced. So you may be familiar with the sustainable development goals. Okay, yeah, you probably have seen it. And, and uh, the question here is, if my country or my business is sustainable? And in here, we have, and I was talking about this in one of my, uh, in my own, one of my lectures for this year, on the way we think of the sustainable development goals. So those sustainable development goals that you see in here have been uh, arranged in this way. And this is what uh, they call the wedding cake. So, uh, so we have three aspects in uh, the, or the three pillars of sustainability. You, if you see, you have the economy on the top, Okay, you have society in the middle because society uses economy and environment, okay, in, in their uh, activities. But what is the base of this uh, of this wedding cake of sustainable development? The, the base is the environment. So basically, the environment is what is keeping all the other uh, pillars. So of course, so in that in this uh, pyramid, we need to really take care of the environment if we want 
to have a, a development. If we destroy the environment in here, then the other is going to be very uh, difficult, you know, to be sustained. So, how uh, we integrate uh, the ecosystem services into the decision making? For this, I use always uh, this uh, a graph or this diagram uh, from daily, in which you have your economic activity uh, and that will have some consequences, some outcomes. And here is where you have um, many times externalities. So your activity will produce some changes in the ecosystem services. For example, uh, uh, there is an energy plant, a coal plant, let's say, producing energy and uh, it produces waste. So it affects the uh, environment. So that generates some information that is taken by the people. So when you see their preferences and uh, values, it's okay, we need to measure those impacts. Okay, we need to see what our uh, and generate that information that we go to the uh, policy institutions and they make decisions on uh, okay, how we should proceed, how we uh, what are the measures we take to uh, do sustainable the same things more sustainable, or if we have to stop a development. Like now you see uh, energy transition. Okay, we are going from fossil fuels to more renewables. Okay, so why? Because we want to reduce those uh, those impacts in the environment, but still that doesn't mean that we don't do an environmental assessment. We still do it because uh, these other options also have some impacts. Okay, so. Uh, when that information goes to the policy institution, the policy makers, what they do, they uh, design a policy instrument which are incentives. Incent for example, a tax or a subsidy. So when, when I was talking about the wind power, so uh, you value the impacts of the, of the wind power, and then you design the compensation scheme that you need to give to the people who are impacted, okay? Based on that. So what happens is that it will uh, influence the economic activity, and then we start again the this flow, okay? Because we, we need to keep moving, okay? Uh, we, we even went, for example, in cars, if you think in, in vehicles, we went uh, from having just gasoline, petrol, to then uh, gas, and now we are moving to electric vehicles, uh, and we are even start talking about hydrogen. Okay, which I'm not going to get there. There is a lot of discussion, but that that is a process. You see, that we are getting the information, we are getting the value, and then we go again to a policy. The uh, policymakers put up subsidies so people who buy more electric vehicles or electric bikes, and then they go again. So that is, and in all this, we need environmental assessment to see what those impacts are and make those uh, decisions. Okay, let me talk about externalities. One of the goals. I said about this environmental assessment is actually to consider uh, an uh, externalities. So, what is an externality? Externality comes from external effects. So, it's very easy to, to remind, uh, uh, to remember. Okay, what when we have external effect of an activity, we just call it externality. What is a uh, study is when, and this is uh, taken from the book of Perman and colleagues. So, when the production or consumption decision of one agent 
have an impact on the utility or the profit of another agent. In an unintended, and this is important, is in an unintended way. And when no compensation or payment is made by the generator of the impact to the affected party. So, uh, for example, uh, when I'm gonna uh, put up a very easy when someone is smoking, okay? Uh, if I smoke, for example, and I produce pollution that affects the elder, but I am not compensating any other person. Okay? I am consuming and have a negative impact. That negative impact is extraordinary. Why? Now, externality, and this is important, unintended. If it is intended, then it's not. It's not. We are talking about it. But it's in an unintended way because I'm getting the utility from a small game. The others get affected, and I'm not giving to the others any compensation. Okay? So, uh, that is a type of externality. They are positive and negative externality. Okay, they are not only negative externalities, but we focus more, of course, on the negative externalities because we want to improve uh, environment or uh, or what are the social parts. So the negative is when the action of one party imposes a cost to the other part. So it's basically when the impact on the lifestyle is adverse, when we have something negative. Uh, the positive is when the action of one party benefits the other party. So when the impact on the bystander is beneficial, when we have a benefit. Uh, so anything can, uh, anyone uh, can you think about a positive externality? Any of you would have an, an example? But you can tell me about the positive externality. Yeah, anyone would like to try? You can you can say it in uh, in Bahasa. Bahasa. Yes. Because I don't join it. Sekarang tahun berapa sih? 16. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, very good example. <laughs> yes, so um, uh, and let's put it in a in a more social way. I have a house in a, in a area and then I decide to do a nice garden and I plant trees. And as uh, as you said, like you plant trees, you plant uh, all smaller plants, flowers, and uh, and what is the cause? What is the impact of that? We we can do an environmental assessment. What is the impact? So the the, the impact is that you are in a helping environment, producing more oxygen. That and I am not thinking, you know, of the positive part of it. I just do it because I like it. I want to see the trees. I want, but as a consequence, I am helping others producing a better um, a quality of air and also a nicer view. So, uh, and even if you want to, uh, to go a bit further, sometimes when you do that, the uh, price of the house can go up. Not the, uh, only your own house, say, or also the others, because it looks nicer, okay? So that's how we also have positive externality. So it's not only about negative. However, however I'm going to be talking about negative externality because it's what we are most likely 
to use the parameter assessment for and what you most likely uh, will do uh, later. So, example of negative externality, and I ask you about the positive externality because it's generally the, the more uh, difficult to identify. We always think about oh, uh, a negative externality, and it's what we all see uh, generally every day. So, some examples of uh, negative externalities are uh, the first one is uh, a dam, a large one, and that's what I'm going to be talking about example today. Uh, the large uh, dam for uh, generating hydropower. Then you have, uh, of course, the cars, the fumes of the cars, and all the CO2 pollution that it produces. Then uh, you have all the industrial uh, waste, the um, uh, air pollution, the water uh, pollution that is created by uh, the industry. All of those are a uh, negative externality. So a company produces uh, a product and then they just produce the, you know, the CO2 emissions and the waste, but they don't pay anyone. So that's why we need the environmental assessment to see what or are those impacts and to take action. And take action either uh, decided should we go ahead with that project or not? And or to decide, okay, if we are going ahead with that project, let's put measures that will mitigate, alleviate, okay, this uh, impact. Let's tell to the company, you have to put a filter, for example. Let's tell the company, you need to, uh, to have uh, a certain type of uh, measures to clean the water or the soil, okay? So that is, um, oops. So the problem is we have generally with this is uh, when there is a market, it's easy. When there is a market, there are prices there, and we just uh, know exactly what is the cost of the problem. But the problem is uh, when we don't have a market. So market not always provide, not uh, always provide the direct information regarding the value society places on changes in the provision of environmental goods and services. Again, what I was asking you before, so what is the, the, the cost or the value of the clean air, of the water? It's very difficult to know because there is not a market. We don't, we don't buy and sell air, you know? So how we put the biodiversity? That is, that is what I do at the moment a lot. So like, how we value biodiversity? What is the value of a, of a shark? What is the value of a turtle? So there is no market, okay, for that. So, so the main challenge is how we integrate the nature and its value in the everyday decisions and uh, in complete social and environmental assessments. So that's what I want uh, to show you. In here, so how we use, and you will probably be uh, studying environmental evaluation techniques uh, at some point. So, and we have them for this environmental evaluation. The environmental evaluation, what does it assign a monetary value to environmental impact, especially on those impacts that have uh, no market, pay, uh, no, no markets. Okay, so. As I was telling you, like the air, the water quality, and, and, and that type of things. So, the principal motivation when we do environmental evaluation is to do cost benefit analysis and environmental assessment. So, in general, when you talk about cost benefit analysis, you just use financial uh, information. So, how much is the cost of a project? X. Uh, is you take the, the cost of the materials, you take the cost of the inputs. What uh, are the benefits? You, you is the price you sell 
a product that that is. And what happened with the externality? What happened with that pollution that the business created? Where is that? It's not considered. And so when that happens, we have a market failure. So the market is not efficient. And then, uh, again, I go to environmental assessment. We need the first environmental assessment to then uh, be able to make decisions and make uh, or propose sustainable solutions. So while also we use environmental regulations to design policy instruments, compensation schemes uh, and introduce also the values in national accounting, which is something that is very used nowadays. And compensation schemes and policy instrument is what I was telling you before. So how we know it, how to value the impact, the visual impact on the landscape of our wind farm or of hydropower, as I'm gonna show you now. So uh, what is the value? We need that to know that value so we can know how much we have to compensate the people that are affected. So uh, there are different types of techniques. I'm not gonna be and it's running uh, fast. So there are different techniques you have for doing environmental evaluation. One of them is revealing preferences. Uh, where which is the one we only use um, use values. So uh, is is done by sorting but what people spend to go for a national park or so. I'm gonna be talking here on a uh, we call it continuous evaluation, which is a state of preference methodology. We use surveys in this to ask people how much people are willing to pay to avoid uh, a certain impact. So what we do first is we identify impacts. So, and, and here is when I break this case study, I will say it. So I'm gonna talk about hydropower development with a large town. So in Chile, and this is an example how uh, they did uh, environmental assessment, and how we use uh, continuous evaluation or continuous evaluation or environmental evaluation. So, a company came and said, We are going to uh, bring to the country the solution for uh, the energy to need for the electricity. And they said, We are going to build five dams in, in the most important river of the country. So think about the biggest river that is used for tourists, and, and then uh, a company will come and put five big walls uh, and, and develop that to produce electricity. So uh, obviously the first thing is like, okay, but wait, we will have electricity, but what is the cost of that? We're talking about what, what are the externalities? So the first thing you need to think about those. Uh, what are the impacts and how I measure the impact? Are the value of the impact low enough uh, so that the benefits are better or not? So, so um, uh, in many developing countries like in Chile, we have a uh, I classes because there are few developments of renewable energy projects that are not renewables, no green tariffs, uh, programs, and few incentives to develop other alternatives. But we still need to supply the energy and fulfill the environmental goals. So, what happened with renewable energy? So, the option, the other option to these uh, big dams was renewable energy. But the problem or the barrier is that the renewable has a high cost. A high cost, and it doesn't, uh, the, the thing is like that cost, we said, the, the government before said, oh no, it's too expensive. 
Let's do a solar and, uh, and wind power or no? We better do coal or we better do hydropower because renewables are very expensive. But then you come and say like, ah, uh -uh, wait. It's true, it's more expensive. And we are thinking, but that means that you are thinking only in market value. What happens if we take into account then the all the social and environmental uh, impact of that? Probably, would the, the, would the project have probably the same cost, but probably can go up uh, the cost of, uh, of the other sources? So that's what you want to do. That's what you want to evaluate. Um, so there, there are there were for the country three uh, three types of um, of sources. So one is let we need to produce this electricity. So how we produce it? The country can continue with fossil fuels, can do renewable energy, or can uh, build these big dams with hydropower. So here is when we do our environmental assessment. How uh, the company, how the government make the decision. And I'm gonna present this very quick. I'm not gonna do it because of, uh, I mean, this is a, a lecture that I can do in two, three lectures, but um, to give you an example, uh, we, I'm gonna just focus on that part. So renewable or higher power. Okay, so what the company was saying, the company was saying we need to build the dams because it's uh, because it's a very uh, it is very cheap the electricity with the dams and the renewables are very very stressed. And then okay, well let's see what happens. Just to give you an idea, and this is something you can think a lot uh, here in uh, Indonesia, because you have a lot of tourists in this country. You have wonderful places uh, that I haven't visited them uh, uh, all, but uh, I hope I, I will. So, so you think like places, uh, natural places in, in here that, that if you get a lot of tourists and pollution and so, so that type of things that you need, okay, you need to assess what is the cost of that tourist and how you, in this case, uh, where the place where they were going to put the dams was uh, the Chilean Patagonia. It's a very natural place. It's very touristic, but it's very touristic. It's very expensive to go there. It's very touristic for the people who actually live at, for the Europeans, people from the US. Uh, they have endangered species, a lot of biodiversity, and those are only a few features. So, first thing we do, let's see what the impacts are. Okay, so let's start to do this uh, thing. And then let's see that really the uh, renewables are not an option. So, what, uh, what we did then, okay, let's. We identify what is doing the project. It's flooding 5,000 areas of cultivated lands, wetlands, primitive territories, important cattle farming, agricultural and tourist areas, biodiversity conservation zone. Those are the impacts of the uh, something. What other impacts we have? And you will see that I'm gonna. Oops. So, visual impacts on the landscape. So uh, that is actually that dam you see there is the same company that built that dam in the uh, central Chile. So they were going to be even larger than that, five of those. So the river is cut, the biodiversity of fish can go up and down. Um, and then you have resettlement. So the communities that were living in the places that were going to be flooded have to be recycled and the consequences of that. Okay. Other impact uh, is the network. Oh, 
what was that? There. The installation and the installation of the pilot. And I could see that I came from uh, from uh, Jakarta. I came to here on the train, and uh, I, I see all this uh, uh, beautiful uh, uh, rice fields, and then you see all the pylons of electricity. So, so yes, uh, that that is additional impact. The same is going to be here in a very large, uh, long. Uh, so, what uh, then you do here is you analyze the willingness to pay of the household for generating the electricity using renewables, which is more expensive than the traditional hydropower in order to avoid the environmental and social impacts of hydropower. So what you understand is, okay, the, the numbers, the market value tells you that renewables is more expensive. And now, the, okay, let's do the environmental assessment and then let's identify all these I was telling you so are externalities. The externalities of hydropower. Okay, obviously, we also consider externalities of renewables, and then we take it and ask people how much people are willing to pay to avoid those externalities of hydropower and produce the electricity with renewables. That will give you the value of the externalities. So let's see if we take into account those values that the companies are not taking into account, if the renewable energy sources are still more expensive. And so what we did, and very quickly on this, we uh, did a surveys in the main cities in Santiago, in Chile, that is the map of Chile, it's a very long country, if you uh, just Google it, uh, then and you'll see it's a very long country. So they wanted to produce all this electricity in this wonderful um, natural place in the very south, and then with all these pilots and drivers, bring all the, um, all the electricity to the blue part, Santiago Concepcion. Not a single kilowatt was going to stay in the south where all the impacts are produced. So we start to think like there are some social things there. We're going to have something. Okay. Uh, so um, we then uh, uh, got the households uh, to, um, uh, to answer our question, and we present a scenario in which we describe the energy situation in Chile. We present the hydropower with all the impacts we then uh, present the renewables and we ask them uh, their willingness to pay. I'm gonna, okay, okay, okay. the willingness to pay for avoiding them. So that we are looking at the value of those externalities. And um, this is just a very, very quick. The first thing we did was, okay, and you always need to know that. Uh, this when you do this type of study, when you do work with surveys, see if your sample is representative. So we we got uh, the amount of uh, almost half of our sample was female with you know, with the age of forty three and uh, thirteen years of education, and um, we test and it it, it was. Um, uh, significant, so okay, it's representative uh, from the population. And uh, the only thing we got more women answering this and that because um, it, it is funny in Chile, and when you go to the to the household, and then they say like, who is the head of the household, and they they will say they will say say the man, but they ask who pays the bills. If they want, they say so. So that's why we we didn't get that balance, and um, but we want to actually who pays. So look at this. We ask them what is the um, the energy source they would prefer. So without doing any evaluation, without doing anything, we can see that they prefer wind power and solar. So we can start to think that they will. Want 
to go for a more renewable instead of a higher power and on the impact. But let's do it more properly. And so then um, we ask, and this is important, if you see, uh, there is a 10% of the people who have been in the area where the large dams were going to be built. Okay, so only 10% uh, have seen that area, the natural area. And why? Because it's a very expensive place where really tourists with money, which are mostly from outside the country, come and visit. Um, and that's important because when we did the, the study, then you run a, a study, a continuous evaluation study. I'm not going to tell you how to run it, but you go and ask the people the willingness to pay, and you and you get some salaries. Uh, for results like this, and the estimations results. And I'm not gonna um, uh, be telling you how to estimate uh, that in here, but how do you use it? So when you get the result of that, what can you say? You, what you are getting here is, for example, in here, uh, you see what is significant, this parameters of my logic uh, model, with no logic model, so what is significant, you can say, like, a gender has no impact, that people, the age was significant and negative. So the younger people were willing to pay more money than older people to uh, support renewables. So what you get here in these coefficients is uh, the coefficients on um, how this variable affects the willingness to pay. Okay, so for example, uh, education is a positive and is uh, significant. So people who have higher education are more willing to pay to support the renewables uh, and avoid the externalities of higher power. So interesting here is that the people who plan to visit the place are willing to pay more and it's significant. But the people who already visit the place are willing to pay less. So everyone was, was like, what? What happened then? So what happened is that places like this, uh, people generally go once in their life. So if you go here, you take your pictures with the river, you enjoy rafting, and then you probably don't go. Uh, but if you haven't gone, you say like, wait, wait, wait. Don't build the dance. Wait, I want to see it, so I will be willing to pay. Yeah. Anyway, you use this information and you calculate the willingness to pay. And we got that we need. What do I just uh, look at? Mean willingness to pay. That is uh, the, uh, the money people are willing to pay to avoid uh, the consequences or the impacts of the higher power and to support renewables. That is the evaluation of the uh, impact. That is what gives you the, evalua the evaluation of the externalities that the cost benefit analysis was not taken into account. That is the part that is uh, missing uh, in here that we need to see. If now we take into account that cost, are the renewable energy sources still more expensive? And this is important. You can take really important decisions on, uh, on how to go ahead with the, uh, with the electricity or the energy in a country. So, so okay, what did you do then is with that, uh, with, with that number, you aggregate to the whole, because you have for one household for one month, you aggregate it to the whole population, okay? How, for how long are this project? For 20 years, you bring it to a uh, net present value using a discount rate, okay? And, um, and then you define all, all those parameters, like the interest rate or discount rate, the period of time, and then you end up with a, Mm -hmm. Okay, 
Uh, yeah. um, so uh, you, you calculate the present uh, value, and then you end up with a number that is the value of your externality that you are going to be introducing in the cost benefit analysis. And look what we got. We have a few scenarios of uh, of production of an energy with renewables, with wind, biomass, solar, and geothermal. So you have those four scenarios. I'm gonna only show you because it repeats for all except for the last one. So what you need is the cost of those. So the cost of the uh, rest is when you renewal and the cost of the large land. Look at the cost. You see that the cost of renewables, all the scenarios, is always higher than the cost of large lands. So if you only have that information, what you said, we, we go for large lands. It's cheaper, true? Now, we calculate the cost of externalities. We have done an environmental assessment. We then calculate the cost of externality. Let's bring the cost of externality here and see what happens. So we calculate that the aggregate of that was uh, 3.5 almost uh, million of US dollars. Okay? That's for all the scenarios. So what happened? Look at this. So if we add, you can do it in two ways. Like you can, you have the cost of the renewables and the cost of flash down, and you do the difference, okay? And then you compare that difference with the business way. Or the more correct way, you have, let's look at the scenario one. You have about 5,000 the cost of the renewables. And the uh, large land is only 4.7. But if I take the cost of externality, is 3.5. 4.7 plus 3.5, 3.4 is uh, about 8,000. So now, how much is the, 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 the uh, hydropower? The real cost of the hydropower is 8,000 million. Uh, and the renewables is only five years. So basically, what we can say here is that if we introduce the externalities, we did our uh, environmental uh, assessment, we identify those, we try to value those, we did the value, we introduce that in a cost benefit analysis, and what we get? That what seems to be the cheaper option wasn't the cheapest option, was actually more expensive than the renewables. Then it of course goes to a governmental a decision, to a company decision, uh, and, um, and we use that information to inform the government and the company assessment uh, to provide guidelines to assess the projects and the decisions. So the country needs to make a decision on how to proceed. Uh, to design the policy instruments, like uh, should we uh, put a premium or not? And uh, um, so the takeaway of this is that environmental relations techniques play a key role in contributing to complete, to conduct complete social environmental assessment. And they inform policy and help in the design of the policy instrument. So if you want to know what happened with this, because we did it long ago, this type of study had an impact on the decision making. Uh, the dams, uh, what the company wanted to do, uh, was not well taken by the people living in the country. They made a big social opposition. Okay? And uh, uh, the government that had decided to go ahead had to stop the project because there was a lot of social opposition and because uh, studies like this showed that actually renewables work was an option. 
um, and in policy instruments, so that value could be used to generate, for example, Sweden, they charge uh, the, the households for renewal. It's a fee that all the, all the households have to pay to support renewal. So it's a charge to households that goes to a subsidy that supports renewal. And then you get situation like so, okay, that is for today uh, about a bit how you do uh, and uh, how important are environmental assessment, environmental evaluation, etc. So, if you have any question, Mas Lukman, Mohamed Lukman, can we have? Okay, thank you. <laughs> okay, thank you. So my name is my name is Mono Luman Iskanda, and it will be a long uh, question. Okay, <laughs> sorry. So uh, like uh, Miss uh, Claudia said, the company. Uh, we will have to give the compensation for the impact, the negative externality, and then uh, for the people who live the near company. And what about people who are far to the area? And but the impact, uh, effect like increase the temperature we feel, and uh, like news and hot news, uh, hot news in Indonesia. Uh, it's called the. Other company uh, also uh, recently opened the thermal power plant, and they have the respondent and the shareholders uh, protesting for from the policy that policy because the effect will be bigger. But such company uh, like Doxy and non, do not respond the uh, protesting, and also. Uh, my question how the compensation for all people besides the tax from the government from for the ex negative externality impact like we, we feel the temperature is literally uh, high in this time okay thank you hello hello and um, yes uh, thank you for the question and um, it's actually a very relevant question and what I present here is what we can do as an academic, as academics, or what the companies uh, can do or uh, to buy. There is a really uh, important thing here. Many of these decisions sometimes are uh, made with a political uh, uh, with a political influence, and sometimes even though. The, 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 the best is something different. There are political uh, uh, interests in the middle, and sometimes that drives, unfortunately, some of the decisions. Now, uh, the, the social opposition is a typical uh, thing in, uh, when we talk about energy. And social opposition, what does generally is delay, delay uh, and uh, this decisions and increase a lot of the costs. The what you have described is a typical situation in which uh, the, those costs have not been included. So, so if we include those costs into the project. What the question is exactly what I said. What will happen? We will we'll still go for that uh, fossil fuels or we, or not? On the other uh, and and there is a lot uh, when we work with policymakers. Sometimes, sometimes, uh, for example, the carbon tax. I was telling you, the carbon tax seems like the best solution. For not uh, the resolution of the best practice for the reduction of, of air pollution in France. But people don't accept that. 
and therefore we should, uh, the, the policy is not working. It's not working, but it has taken time. So if that is something recently, it will take some time until uh, probably those costs are taken into account. And then they, uh, which is what happens in many other countries, I have seen uh, uh, even in Chile, they open uh, as well the coal plants when uh, when Argentina decided not to supply more gas. And uh, they said that we have to go for that. A lot of social organization, but it took it took uh, like five uh, between five and ten years until they stopped uh, the coal plants. And uh, so so yes, that was one of the points. I think I'm missing one another point. Your question. There was another question. Right. Okay, excellent. Is that uh, when when the people are not in the area? Yes. Uh, all these things and uh, are. When, when we talk about um, evaluation or uh, environmental assessment, we talk all right of an area. And generally, the conversations are good for people in that. But we need to remember that valuation is the values. We have different types of value. One value is the use value, and other is non use value. So the use value, which is the easier to see, is uh, when, when you are in an area and you use the area, for example, uh, you use a, a national park or, or the area uh, where you live, or on the, you, you use that place and you will have an evaluation from that place. But what happens with the people who are not in there? There might still, there is a non use value. People may be willing to pay for conservation for something they don't see. But they they feel right that that needs to sit. And the typical example are whales, whales or biodiversity. So uh, um, or the, I I was just uh, conducting research in uh, Ecuador, and there is uh, a giant tortoises in there. I should take a uh, show you a picture later. And so so uh, those uh, biodiversity exist in in Ecuador. But we don't see it. But if I someone asks me, are you willing to pay for conservation of that? I say yes, because there is a there is an opportunity, the option that one day I can go and see, or because I have a request value, which means that I want pay future generations to enjoy that. So, so in general, compensation schemes are designed for that people only but they impact the whole society because that will produce a better uh, living to that area that indirectly will impact the others because others may have uh, may want to have the opportunity to go and get a, a clean environment or to that area. So if you, if you subsidize them, you will produce a better uh, a better environment okay now of course in that case we are talking about how to compensate the impact of a uh, fossil fuel development so you need to think in that other direction so and and yeah i, I see that as a typical example of decisions that are driven more in a Political way, uh, sometimes I'm not sure if that is the situation, but I have seen that a lot. And uh, unfortunately, you need to really be very strong with, with evidence to try to influence uh, some policymakers and stakeholders. So, yeah. So, uh, I think it is something like an idea. Uh, but 
Yeah, I, I have seen that a lot. I am from Latin America. So uh, we have similar situations. And uh, and this, what I'm, I'm, I have just told you here, I shouldn't be saying this. Uh, there is no recording? No? No, we are not recording this. Okay. Uh, you need to be very strong, guys, on this. And then uh, when I teach this, I always say, like, you need to act in an ethical way. When I did this study, uh, the, the company, not the company directly to me, but the company um, to a third party contacted my parents and uh, told them that how, how much money I wanted to, to, to give them all this information. And so I, I just stopped my research. Because uh, the company, uh, it was a lot of money for the company and the company has influenced the government. So the government was supporting the higher power development. And the higher power were accepted. So they did the environment. What they did, and here I go back to the environmental assessment. They presented to the government an environmental assessment, which was completely rubbish. It was very badly done. So prepared people got on board and made 3,000 pages of comments to the government and said, like, they are not addressing the fish. They are not addressing the uh, forest that is uh, going to be flooded. Okay. So uh, because of all the social opposition, the uh, big, big celebrities, uh, artists also were making and against. So that influenced the government as well. And the government will say, like, no, we don't want. So uh, uh, of course I did this uh, this project and I showed them we can go for renewables. No, these are the costs. And um, and yeah, they 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 actually influence. They lobby. They they are corruption. There is a lot of corruption. And uh, it's many times it could be in your hands. You will be the future. It could be in your hands, the decisions like this. And you need to do really, and you need to act in an ethical way, considering society, environment. Uh, and I always tell my students, I could now be in a job having, uh, having a great life instead of, uh, of being uh, here uh, lecturing. But my, my choice was to go ahead and to continue the study and, um, and not selling it. And the company for 50 years, for 50 years, they managed to, uh, to de destroy uh, two rivers, other rivers in Chile. Unfortunately, this project was stopped. Was stopped thanks to the social opposition, thanks to other political parties, that's important sense to all the political parties who were able to uh, go against the company and, and the other parties of the government. When we are talking about political, including with the environmental, since it's, it's a hard thing, but we need to do it and we need to start from ourselves. Okay. Um, Anybody else wants to raise some questions? I saw that only Muhammad Bukman. Okay, please. I'm sharing my happy smile then. <laughs> Another person sharing the questions. Please. Uh, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, my name is Muhammad Alexander Lukamini. Uh, I want to talk about climate change. As we know, in this era, there's a lot of issue about climate change. Climate change made many bad impacts to the environment, like dryness, global warming, fires, and stuff. So my question is, what the government do, and we as students, to overcome climate change? Uh, thank you.
Yeah. On climate change, that's a very complex <laughs> and very, very broad. So for climate change, each government is doing have has their own agenda, or a group of governments have their own agenda on climate change, mainly focused, it was mainly focused on air pollution at the beginning. And now it has opened a lot to other areas, uh, including biodiversity. So um, in terms of energy uh, and things like I shown here, sometimes uh, the options, some environmental options are indeed more expensive. I, I didn't uh, show you the, the example of geothermal. If you look at geothermal in here, uh, it is it's more expensive that project that if we even consider the uh, externalities. So still, then if we have that, we have to go for hydropower. And so, so uh, that will happen with the fossil fuels, which will pr produce a lot of uh, impact and climate change. So sometimes uh, there is a trade-off. Uh, and the governments need to go for more environmental uh, friendly and, uh, solutions, even though they are not the cheapest, but that is to avoid the future consequences of, uh, of those impacts or that really climate change. So uh, uh, what actions we can uh, mention are uh, the agreements on uh, uh, Target or targets uh, that other have on evolution. So uh, the energy part is a big one because energy produces uh, thirty over thirty percent. The energy production is over thirty percent of the um, uh, emissions, and we know that emissions is one of the main contributors to climate change. So um, the <clears throat> ban of uh, continuing with uh, fossil fuels for energy generation is uh, one of the things. Uh, the introduction of, of renewable energy sources, the support the governments give to the renewable energy sources in terms of um, green tariff subsidies, um, that is on that way to reduce uh, the, the generation of emissions from energy generation. Uh, sources like fossil fuel and try to then uh, in, uh, boost or foster in, uh, the renewables. Same with the electric vehicles, if you think in transport, as long as they are produced with renewables. You do need to be careful in that in that part, okay? So yeah. And well, that's a that opens also, of course, a complete other topic, the climate change is much wider. I think it took several seconds to turning on the microphone. Okay, thank you. Was Alexander Sokarman, yeah. Climate uh, change is very broad, yeah, broad uh, theme that I, I think we need one semester to talk about it. <laughs> or more than <laughs> okay, other you wanna okay, please don't forget to keep your full name. So my, name, my name is Eduardo Nomadi Manager. It's okay, take your time. No rush, no rush, no worry. I wanna, I wanna ask you, uh, is CSR sufficient to solve negative externalities caused by the company, especially when it relates to the environmental impact? Is, a, is there any other alternative? Thank you. Great. Uh, okay, uh, good question. Um, yes, uh, 
it is it is uh, one of the options, but not the only one. Because it doesn't take into account something we were talking, like uh, a social uh, a social um, acceptability, for example. And um, and there has been uh, some approaches, uh, development approaches, in which uh, you take a more broader uh, view. So in which you introduce not only the environmental uh, assessment, but then you think that with the social uh, assessment, uh, where we take into account in the, nowadays it's also work a lot with surveys. So uh, if you survey people and uh, you ask uh, what are the options and they would like to follow, uh, which is different to the evaluation, okay? So because sometimes, as I say, like in France, uh, the assessment gives you that a carbon tax is needed or, uh, or you need a certain type of points, but it's not applicable. Okay, so yes, and, and nowadays a lot of psychologists as well are involved in the decision maker uh, to study the part of uh, uh, and sociologists as well. Uh, social acceptability of, uh, of those and um, and also the accounting uh, the account the accounting methods are also uh, important so uh, yes it's not the only one and we always need to be open to take the other things on board <laughs> Okay, Mas Ginanjar, nah, calon presiden. Oh, salah, Ganjar. Ganjar is one of our um, candidate of president. Almost the same like him, his name, Ginanjar and Ganjar. Aha. <laughs> so I said, almost a president. The future president. The future president. The future president. Um, <laughs> okay, uh, I think time is up and we already have three persons who already raised their hands for our questions. But before that, let's give applause to the Claudia. Well, we have um, three your prize souvenir for the person who raised some questions. It's already there near to Professor Enda. So let me invite three of the person who raised questions, Muhammad Lukman, Muhammad Alexander Sultanai, uh, Mr. President, Mr. Kinaita. <laughs> Please come in here. Don't get me wrong. I'm, I'm not a person who support Kinaita, actually. I'm support Kinaita for the next president. Okay. Okay, I think it's really nice that all of you have the souvenirs from us. Um, thank you also for Rodi and also Claudia for to have, having this um, guest lecture. And um, 
I think all of the questions was really tough. Uh, I, I was not predicted that you have you raised a question, especially concerning the the company, the, the negative externalities, the climate change, the CSR, because in our class, me and Buena, usually they just like getting fired concerning the TSR. What is they have to do to protect the environment and also all things that the stakeholders, the government is raising a lot of issues for the environmental impact. Okay, everyone, I'm so proud for you. And thank you for all of you, your participations. Um, and this session, I will give back to the master of ceremony, please. Okay, please. Okay. So, so yes, uh, well, before I, I, I read, I just wanted to, um, to wish you all the best in the in your studies and uh and uh, well very good luck uh in you know, all, all your uh, studies and uh, future i hope you learn a lot from and i'm sure uh you will yeah uh, i give back to the master ceremony thank you okay thank you Uh, jadi untuk sekarang kita sesi terakhir yaitu sesi foto bersama ya. Jadi mungkin nanti pada para pembicara ataupun dosen di depan, kemudian teman-teman stay di belakang ya. Seperti itu konsepnya Bu. Uh, thanks God, we are the end of the soft launching of the WNME Master of Economics and Guest Lecture uh, 2023. I as the host of all this, if there are any mistakes, wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Ya teman-teman yang belum presensi sekarang presensi untuk yang kuliah presensinya berdasarkan yang hadir sekarang jadi saya tidak buka my classnya maka saya akan menulis saya yang masukkan berdasarkan hasil kuliah hari ini kan oke okay? ya masih semuanya jangan lupa minggu depan eh minggu depan kegradasi ya Jumat harusnya degradasi. Baik, ya. hari ini seharusnya ada green ekonomi jam 12 lebih 30 tapi karena saya uji kemarin begitu saya share polling langsung ya asin kronus. Saya akan upload video dan juga materi saya yang saya bu bikin. Uh, nanti silahkan kalian baca, lalu tolong reply diskusi ya, ada nilainya. Lalu green economy kelas A, besok ya, itu sudah ada kuis. Jadi besok 
Nah, kalian tuh asinkronus memang banget ya. Besok ya, tulis asinkronus lagi. Atau mau yang sinkronus? <laughs> Untuk ekonomi hijau yang B, kapan ya ekonomi hijau B ya? Kelihatannya hari Kamis ya? Kamis dan Jumat ya? Ya, karena itu asinkronus, apa kita kuliah online asin, di hari Kamis? Sinkronus atau online? Hah? Asinkronus, wow, yes. asinkronus terus hari Jumatnya kalian berarti ngisi kuis ya. Hari Jumat untuk degradasi kita ujian. Jadi kalian harus asin terus. Asin Minggu depan masuk kelas lo ya. Apa oh, ya kak? Kalian nggak kalah sama kita lo? Nah yuk semacam kuliah masuk kita. Ya deh ya. Kalau gitu tolong minggu ini bisa di fokus di my class. Oke, terima kasih. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.